Hello everyone, my name is Rajiv. Uh, I'm an associate professor at College of Liberal Arts, Shanghai University, Shanghai, China. Today I'm going to talk about India-China relation, past, present and future. Uh, before I begin, let me go back into a little bit history about India-China, what I call it civilizational connection. Uh, we all know that both India and China are neighbors and oldest civilization in the world and both have fascinated each other culturally, even uh, civilizationally over the past two millennia. Across these centuries, two great civilizations have continuously communicated with each other and until recent times had been a, seen a very peaceful coexistence for over 2000 years, except in 1962 and then we have seen uh, some um, border transgression in recent years. Now, what fascinated China? We have to uh, think over and, and that comes very naturally that we have to see that what is that fascinate the Chinese most. And when come to India, in recent days, uh, the Indian IT is one of the big birds word in China. When we talk about IT, all Chinese have a very soft and they are kind of like um, they appreciate the Indian rise in IT sector. But before that, we have seen a Buddhism, a Buddhism uh, disseminated into China uh, in a Han dynasty during the first century AD. Uh, we have seen there are um, monuments, there are like buildings of white horse monastery to accommodate two highly proficient uh, Buddhist scholars monks from uh, India. Uh, we have also uh, seen and we have also know the history tells us that many Chinese scholars in search of wisdom de and deeply motivated by the quest of knowledge undertook some of the most erodous continental journey to the India. And that journey and we all know about uh, um, the monk Wen Sang traveling from China to India during the uh, and then visiting India, uh, uh, like Patliputra, Lumbini and all this. Uh, and then this journey of Wen Sang has been um, kind of converted into a, a fictional a story uh, that is one of the classic in China known as a journey to the uh, West. And similarly, even the Indian scholars and teachers sim uh, travel to China taught there, were revered, fated and established themselves as a knowledge lighthouse. This movement of Indian scholar monks to China lasted for centuries. We have uh, some of uh, like a scholar like Kumara Jiva, famous Indian monk made valuable contribution to Buddhism in, 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 in China. Now, on the Chinese side, we have known Fa from uh, 342 to 424, Xuan Chang that is known as Wen Sang, Yi Qing are all well-known scholar monks who visited India. And then we have one of the greatest learning institute in India known as Nalanda University during the 5th century to 1197, uh, founded by King uh, Sakraditya. It was the, one of the knowledge center that attracted many travelers, particularly from the East Asia, who came here, studied there, even the Wensang studied there, and then also taught here. This civilizational exchange and interface thus began and was enhanced by centuries of interaction. In fact, India and China formed a formidable civilizational and cultural coalition long before the rise of West. Uh, we have not only these scholars and monks who have traveled, but if you go into the ancient India, then our celebrated epics like Ramayana and Mahabharata contains numerous references to China. The Mahabharata, in fact, refers to China several times and mentions, for example, that the Chinese brought gifts for Pandavas to have this Rajasui Yag. Even uh, the famous Arthasast, the Kautilya Arthasast and Manu Smirti also mention about the, the China. Now, one of the scholar, uh, we call it, uh, name as Thanyun San, uh, he was 
uh, fascinated by India. He came to India and then he was very instrumental uh, in India developing the Chinese study and his son Tan Chung uh, in his book in the footstep of Swen Chang, Tan Yun San in India. He, he very beautifully says that the two great peoples wedded to civilized living in the way of peace naturally find in the exchange of culture and truest expression of their time, their being. Not for them the covetous eyes of neither rapacious plunder nor territorial kind of uh, territorial aggression we have seen. And so that was the India-China relation in the innocent times. Uh, that was the cultural and the religious connection. We have also seen there was a trade relation between India and China well established even in the second century. And that is mentioned by uh, one of the Chinese historian named uh, Si Ma Qian uh, in his uh, book Record of a Historian Foreigners in Southwest uh, in, in a book. That the trade and economic and cultural exchanges between the two civilizations have been traced back at least to the Qin dynasty of China during uh, our contemporary of Maurya dynasty and then Han dynasty in, in, in China. During this period we have seen that the Silk Road was an important path for cultural, commercial and technological exchange between the traders, the merchants and urban dwellers from ancient China and India for almost 3000 years. China traded silk, tea, porcelain and India traded spices, ivory, textiles and precious stones. We have seen there is a kind of, uh, uh, we have a living example right now that we, if we go to the Tun Huang then we can see a kind of replica of Ajanta and Elora in China in the Tun Huang where the many civilizations interacted with each other and that was kind of that interaction gave to a new knowledge that we can see in, in, in China, we can see in, because the civilization thrives on the knowledge sharing. If we stop that interaction then the civilization does not, don't learn from each other. So, and then we have seen that this trade relation continued during the Tang dynasty uh, from 618 to 900, uh, 907, then Song dynasty 960 to uh, 1279 and Yuan dynasty 1279 to 1368. This interaction led many scholars to write uh, volumes of articles and books on the, the exchanges between India and China and how it influenced the Chinese uh, because they were the one who were coming to India in search of knowledge. And one of the, the legendary historian of Asian civilizations, Rene Grosset, uh, he, he says that even the name China is from Sanskrit word. Uh, that might um, kind of like uh, be amazed or kind of wonderful to knowing that even the Chinese, the China name is given by India to the China because if you see that there was a, a state in China uh, called Qin dynasty but legendary historian uh, Rene says that it was not named after the Qin state but it was the, the, the place in what is uh, today is known as Sanxi in, in during that uh, Chanxi. So you have to say that even if you say that Qin like in Chinese it is written as Q-I-N that is the Qin dynasty but when we write in, in, in Sanskrit then we pronounce as a Ch that is become uh, Qin. So that Qin became Qin and Qin to became China when it is kind of like went back to travel back to Europe and then finally Europe to, to, to China because we have this um, we put extra A in the name like Buddha became Buddha, uh, Yog became Yoga. Uh, so that's we can say that uh, even other scholars believe that the Greek word for China uh, Cynthia is also derived from the Sanskrit word uh, Chinasthan. Now what we have to see is that this interaction continued uh, 
uh, and we have seen uh, we have long history of interaction uh, between India and China. Like uh, uh, Wen Sang, we can Chinese, Chinese Wen Chang, we have also individuals like Rahul Sankrityan who, who traveled to the Tibet in the search of lost Buddhist knowledge. And that this there was a kind of like break between in this continuous exchange between India and China when the two country uh, became uh, independent or China called, called themselves as established in 1949. So there was again a renewed uh, a kind of um, interest to revive this interaction and exchange between India and China but the border came to halt or kind of hinder the progress. But nevertheless, when India and China got um, independent and res um, established respectively, then we have seen that during the initial years, uh, we call it India-China uh, Bhai Bhai era or hindi Chini Bhai Bhai era. But that has also a dark clouds over, over the Tibet. But when the Chinese marched to the Tibet in 1950s and then there was a kind of like not so good relationship between India and China. To continue this cordial relationship, both leaders from India and China, they signed uh, an agreement known as Panch Sil, uh, what we know now it has become a kind of a lighthouse of the international relation that the Panch Sil is. Uh, and there from the Panch Sil we have seen that uh, because it was essential that the two countries respect each other's territorial integrity and sovereignty on and the China was that the India should not uh, interfere in the Tibetan issue, so they signed uh, this uh, Pancil Agreement. And uh, I don't need to go into the, this uh, details about the, the Pancil Agreement. And then in during this tense, uh, we can say that tense situation where we have seen Chinese marching to the Tibet and then the Tibetan uh, Dalai Lama was in talk on planning to even uh, India, there was a series of visits made by Indian and Chinese leaders uh, to each other uh, country. In June 1954, Chiang Mai visited New Delhi. Nehru paid a uh, return visit to China in 1954. Again, Chow visited in 1956. And then in 1959, the Dalai Lama came to uh, India. We can say that they fled to India. And, and then the situation became so tense. To ease this situation, again, Chow uh, visited India to in 1960 to, to cool down the temperature but it, uh, it was not a successful and then we have seen that we have this uh, border dispute uh, arising uh, between the India and China. But before this uh, the India and China into the new Aptar we have this uh, British India had this agreement with China in 1913. 14 similar agreement, but the Chinese uh, don't recognize. Uh, they uh, they say uh, Tibet doesn't have right to enter into an any agreement, so they um, outrightly reject this agreement. Uh, and then you have this border between India and China and the Mac Mohan line. So thereby, this Chinese never recognize, uh, formally recognize um, the Mac Mohan line, and so there is a, a kind of a border dispute between India and China. And then we have this Aksai chain which is controlled by uh, Chinese and then we have this Arunachal Pradesh uh, disputed uh, Chinese disputes this territory as known as what they call it Southern Tibet. Now before I go into detail about this border dispute we have to see that these border disputes are not in one sector. So for sake of uh, studying, analyzing this border dispute, we have these three sectors. The one is this is uh, eastern sector on Arunachal Pradesh. We have this uh, middle sector in Himachal Pradesh and Uttarakhand, and then we have this uh, western sector in uh, Jammu and Kashmir uh, and Ladakh. In the eastern sector, Chinese claims 90,000 square kilometer of territory, including uh, our state of Arunachal Pradesh, what they call it Southern Tibet. In the central sector, a boundary disputes is along Himachal Pradesh and Uttarakhand uh, of India. And then we have seen western sector, Aksai Chin, controlled by uh, 500 square kilometer. And now we have seen this, uh, the current uh, Ladakh standoff or stalemate is uh, 
uh, going on in this sector, in Ladakh sector. But there was an attempt to resolve this border disputes and that uh, was started with Nehru and Chong Wen Lai. Even the Chong Wen Lai is uh, said to offer the package deal. Uh, package deal means uh, that was the, on, on the table that China will accept the Mike Mohan line in eastern sector while India should accept Chinese claim in western sector. Uh, eventually, uh, Chinese dropped this idea. So now there is no package deal uh, and Chinese uh, kind of refused to say that there is a package deal. Now they are um, saying that there should be a kind of like uh, sector by sector deal in eastern sector and then we have in the western sector. So that's the package deal is no longer on the table. And during this period that we have seen in the border war that started on October 20, 1962 and then we have seen the all relationship came to the halt. Uh, we cut off our diplomatic relation with uh, kind of uh, China and then in during this period that was the period also we have to keep in mind that was the period of Cold War. So in 1964 and China um, tested nuclear. And so we have this, uh, we also uh, try to have this nuclear uh, test in 1974. Uh, India signed a friendship treaty with Soviet Union in 1971. And we have seen that and, and then there was also uh, Chinese relationship with Soviet Union was not going so smoothly. So there was a kind of like a cold war uh, mentality going on. So the border war uh, was there a kind of like border talk was went to the back burner and we have seen uh, some minor classes in like Cholai incident in 1967, uh, Sumdurung Chu is a um, uh, class in mid 1987, then we have seen in Doklam uh, in 2017 and then we have Ladakh in 2020. Now so I, I don't want to go into war after 1962 to 1988 that was a period where uh, uh, what I call it personally is a uh, in, in terms of people to people contact is lost generation because there was no exchange between these two countries uh, in, in terms of like people to people contact or like economic trade uh, may, maybe a little bit uh, um, a kind of a very uh, minor uh, exchanges between the two countries but it all started to again gain momentum when Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi visited uh, China in December 19 to 23 in 1988 and from there a kind of we have seen a momentum in relationship that we wanted to again uh, revive this relationship and then we have signed a various uh, instrument or agreement between uh, India and China to ensure peace and tranquility along the line of actual control uh, in, in India-China border we have signed in 1993 then we signed another uh, agreement in 1996 that is confidence building measures in military field along the line of control then we signed uh, agreement on border defense cooperation in 2013 uh, before that we have also signed uh, modalities for implementation of confidence building measure in April 2005 and during the Prime Minister Ratal Bihari Bajpayee I think it is uh, one of the best confidence building measure and mechanism to resolve this um, India-China border dispute war to have this special representative talk on India-China border in 2003 uh, that we have signed with and that is already uh, we are still continuing that uh, special representative talk uh, in 2019 and we have not seen in 2020 and 2021 for uh, COVID and India-China tension along the border. Now so that's a India-China the dark side of India-China uh, relationship but we have also some positive and constructive side of India-China relationship is that is the Indian soft power that we tend to always forget that is the Indian Bollywood how famous Amir Khan in China is uh, we have to like see or we have to examine that how the Amir Khan is, is famous in China and but we have failed to translate this our gain in soft power into a kind of 
uh, uh, maneuvering and talking with the Chinese to gain certain positive vibes in a relationship. We have simply failed to, to translate this whole soft power or even civilizational connection between India and China that is of a Buddhism. Or for yoga, or for yoga we, we are not yet able to transform or translate these soft power into a meaningful uh, means to, uh, to our maneuvering capability. So, we need to have this soft power translating into in our gain, but we have failed because there are like if you see that how China is investing in soft power. Uh, if we see that the Chinese have opened the Confucius Institute um, around the world, of course that is under um, continuous attack uh, or charge that Confucius Institute is a kind of a center for espionage. Uh, but that is again that is a different story, but the point here is China is investing millions of dollars to get a soft side of Chinese power. But here we have this soft power in terms of Buddhism, in terms of yoga, in terms of a Bollywood, but we are not able to do that. So, we have to do that and that soft power is not translating because we have a permanent irritant between the India and China that is the border dispute. So, until and unless we do not resolve this border dispute, uh, there is no way that we can move ahead in India-China relationship. Now, let me tell you one more thing that land is precious for both Indian and Chinese. And the one other thing is that the both leadership in India and China, they both thinks, uh, they believe that this, this one of the, the objective is to secure the territorial integrity. And that is true for any nation, they want to secure the territorial integrity. But it is also needed to the both the leaders need to talk in a very peaceful and calm manner that how to resolve this crisis because this is going to come over and over again and we will see what we have seen that after the Doklam in 2017 we have uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi visiting China, uh, President Xi Jinping visiting India. So, we keep doing a reset in India-China relationship. In fact, what I call it we have we are trapped into this reset business in India China relationship. We do not need to do reset, but we need to have this overall in the whole relationship. We need to kind of reorient the India China relationship to make a meaningful uh, uh, dialogue. But that is easier said than done because we have this strategic. Uh, objectives and their strategic orientation also because this is never in the history when the two countries which, is, which are our neighbors setting the boundary uh, rising and emerging simultaneously. Because both India and China wants to become a superpower or emerge as a what they both call it to revive their lost uh, power. So, both countries are trying to regain and then there comes a kind of a strategic challenges to both countries to settle the disputes and continue together on the, the path to what Spain says that Asian century. Uh, but again, have, again easier said than done. Uh, now, we have seen that economic cooperation between India and China, we have uh, roughly uh, 100 uh, billion uh, dollar trade, bilateral trade between India and China, but this trade is not in favor of India. Uh, we have this, the trade is tilted towards China, that is a favoring China because we import more products than the Chinese. So, this uh, trade is also not favorable to us and there is a lot of uh, the Indian side is trying to convince Chinese to open up the, the agriculture sector and the pharmaceutical because this is the sector or IT because this is the, these are the sectors where we have a strong um, capability to uh, match the export import imbalance in between India and China. Uh, but uh, this uh, again is, is again in, um, in dialogue label not yet 
uh, signed or there is like kind of a very uh, slow movement on this front also. But apart from this bilateral uh, economic cooperation the trade that also happened in 1991 that is one of the more I think uh, one of the significant um, departure or you can say that um, pillar uh, in India China relation where we both are trying to explore the new dimension in India China relation and that was opening the border between India and China for the trade and that we have seen in uh, Lipulek and Sipkila in Uttarakhand and Himachal Pradesh. Then we have also seen Nathula border for opening the trade between India and China. So let me conclude this uh, presentation by saying that we have traveled a long journey from 90 minutes, what I call it, from 90 minutes to 600 minutes. What that is means is when Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi met Tang Xiaoping in 1988, the meeting lasted 90 minutes. But when Prime Minister Modi and Xi Jinping met, then that meeting lasted in, in Wuhan for 600 minutes. So we have traveled from 90 minutes to 600 minutes and that, that we can say that the both countries were kind of trying to uh, look at the problems at the same time trying to resolve some of the problems. Then we have also seen that from we have traveled from US dollar 1 billion to US dollar 100 billion in our trade relationship. That's not a very small feat from 1 billion to 100 billion. Of course, that trade deficit is um, the trade imbalance is not in our favor, but that can be um, resolved. We have also cooperated on very global cooperation level like BRICS, climate change, G20, globalization, um, regional comprehensive economic partnership, AIAB. And then the dark side or the, the other side of this relationship is we have also seen the standoff from 7 days to 240 days. From Dalta Beg Oldi in April 2013 to May 2013, 20 days, Demchuk 7 days to Ladakh that is now eight months long standoff. So this relationship what is, is a kind of like full of contradiction. So what I suggest to resolve this problem is, so the, if we see there are like three problems, I call it three body problems, boundary problem, China, Pakistan, Tibet, and then we have a global politics that is a three body problem that one node is uh, keep rotating. So and then because of these problems, we have zero mutual trust on the BRI, on NSG, on United Nations Security Council, Quad, South Asia, Indo-Pacific and India, US. And then what I suggest is five mantras for better cooperation. What the first is sensitivity towards each other core issues. We need to have uh, people to increase people to people contact and then dehyphenating from India Pakistan relationship into the in Chinese policy making. Uh, then we can move ahead in our bilateral relationship. Fourth, we need to resolve this boundary crisis, boundary disputes, otherwise, it will keep coming into our relationship. Fifth, is we need to explore and continue our international cooperation on various platforms. I don't need to go into all the details. Uh, because of the uh, lack of time and thank you for your attention.